Hello fellow teachers and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox and I'd like to welcome you to our study or lesson prep for Helaman chapters 13 through 16 this week. Thank you for joining me. The purpose of the channel is to not only give you insight into the scriptures, but to also provide you with methods and materials to teach that insight to other people in relevant and meaningful ways, whether that's in the classroom or with your own family. If you're interested in lesson plans, the PowerPoint slides that I use, or the handouts that I make, go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to all of those resources. With that said, I invite you to grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It is time to dig deep. Our icebreaker for this section once again revolves around art. And I know that you guys are going to think that I'm just picking on poor old Arnold Freeberg and his Book of Mormon artwork. But uh, honestly, I love Arnold Freeberg and his pictures. They're the ones that I grew up with, and they are beautiful representations of the Book of Mormon stories. However, there are a few that I take issue with. Pictures that I feel misrepresent the story a little bit. And one of those we discussed uh, a few weeks ago was his representation of the Stripling Warriors. This week, we're going to take a look at his depiction of the story of Samuel the Lamanite. Now, I can't display that picture because of copyright issues. So I've tried to reproduce it just a little bit with stick figures. Although I know it doesn't look like much, but I'm pretty sure you know which picture I'm talking about. You have this small little figure dressed in red high up on a city wall with soldiers down below in the foreground aiming and firing arrows at him. Now, you may wonder what on earth could be the problem with that picture. But let me give you a verse that I feel could change your perspective a little bit of this story. Take a look at Helaman chapter 16, verse 7, and see if you can come up with any possible problems with his depiction. What do you think? Well, the phrase that stands out to me is this one. He did cast himself down from the wall. Now, just take a look at that picture. What is the issue with that? That wall is huge. Look how high it is. What would happen if you tried to jump down from that wall? You'd never survive it. It's massive. And Samuel just seems to be dwarfed by it. This verse suggests that the wall must have been quite a bit lower. One low enough to climb up and uh, who knows, maybe he had a ladder or a rope. But to jump down without getting injured definitely gives the impression that it was a much smaller wall. Now, it could still be high, but just not that high. So let's say, for argument's sake, that it's more like 10 to 15 feet high. Uh, a little bit more of a reasonable number for the story. Well, you might be wondering why that even matters. And once again, I don't believe it's an inconsequential detail. When you look at this picture with that itty-bitty Samuel the Lamanite way high up on the wall, what might you attribute the soldier's inability to hit him to? You might begin to think, well, maybe they just missed, or Nephite archers had chronic bad aim, like they were the stormtroopers of the Book of Mormon. Well, I think it takes something away from the miracle of the story. The alternative view, if you picture Samuel the Lamanite on a 15-foot wall, kind of like he was standing on top of a one-story house, and there you are, an archer, or you have a rock in your hand, and he's right there, just feet from you, an incredibly easy shot, and you pull back your bow and, and get his heart right in your sights there, right in the target, and then you let it go, and whoosh, you miss. It glances to the left, and you think, ah, oh, well, maybe I didn't quite focus hard enough. But let's try that again, and so you take another arrow into your string, and this time you really focus in on what you want to hit. No way you're going to miss this time, and you pull back and phew, let it go, and sure enough, the arrow swings to the right. Now, you're dumbfounded. And amazingly, it's not just you. All the other people around you are shooting arrows and throwing rocks. And they all miss. How could this be? And really, there's only one explanation. 
Why couldn't they hit him? We'll look at Helam in chapter 16, verse 2. But as many as there were who did not believe in the words of Samuel were angry with him, and they cast stones at him upon the wall. And also many shot arrows at him as he stood upon the wall. But the Spirit of the Lord was with him, insomuch that they could not hit him with their stones, neither with their arrows. They couldn't hit him because the Spirit of the Lord was with him. It wasn't because they were a bad aim or that he was an incredibly small target. God protected him. In fact, we know that this was a miraculous thing to behold because just look at what happens in the next verse. Now, when they saw that they could not hit him, there were many more who did believe on his words, insomuch that they went away unto Nephi to be baptized. Well, that just proves how miraculous a thing this was. It convinced a number of people that Samuel must be a prophet. And they repented and went to be baptized. And on the other hand, those that didn't accept his words, they had to have some kind of explanation of why this was happening. And it wasn't that he was just hard to hit or really good at dodging rocks. In verse 6, they say, Take this fellow and bind him. For behold, he hath a devil. And because of the power of the devil which is in him, we cannot hit him with our stones and our arrows. Therefore, take him and bind him and away with him. Their only explanation was that he was able to do this by the power of the devil. Is there a lesson for us in this? What does it teach you? A few thoughts. One, God protects his prophets until their message is delivered. Just like Abinadi, Nephi and Lehi in prison, Alma and Amulek in prison, Joseph Smith, these prophets were miraculously protected by God's power until their work was complete. But also, I feel this teaches that when we have the Spirit of the Lord with us, we can't be hit by the arrows of the adversary. Satan is doing the same thing that those Nephites were doing. And the scriptures often speak of the fiery darts of the evil one. He's trying to knock us off our walls of faith and integrity. But if we have the Spirit of the Lord with us, those arrows, those fiery darts, are just going to harmlessly whiz by. The Spirit is there as a protection to us. He exposes Satan's lies. He warns us of spiritual dangers gives us encouragement and fortitude to choose the right. Samuel is an example of somebody who is wielding the shield of faith without actually holding a shield. And we can do the same. Now that's probably the most famous thing that we know about Samuel the Lamanite. It's what we think of when we hear his name, right? But what about his message? Are there any gems of truth that we can discover within the words that he delivered on the wall? Anything unique? Yes. And that's where I'd like to spend the remainder and the bulk of our time, on his message. Ezra Taft Benson once said that the time period just before the first coming of Christ in the Book of Mormon parallels our time period preceding the second coming of Christ. And I think you're going to find that that holds true. Therefore, Samuel's message could also be directed at us of the latter days. Let's see what it has to teach us. If I had to pick one verse that really captures the entire essence of Samuel's message, uh, the crux, the backbone, I would choose Helaman chapter 13, verse 38. And I'd like to introduce that verse with a bit of an illustration. How many of you know what snipe hunting is? If I were teaching a class, I'd allow somebody to explain it to everybody. Snipe hunting is the quintessential practical joke of the old American West and uh, has continued to be kept alive in many a girls camp and scout camp over the years. And what you need for this joke to work is somebody who has never heard of snipe hunting before and a group of knowing associates who are willing to help you perpetrate the scheme. A snipe, for the most part, is a mythological flightless bird without much common sense, which supposedly makes them really easy to catch. 
and apparently they are incredibly delicious to eat. The joke is to convince the target that they exist, and you take them hunting and then laugh at their gullibility. Now, the best snipe hunter I've ever known was my great uncle Verland, who turned snipe hunting into somewhat of an art form. I get this description from my father, who actually experienced this himself. He was taken on a snipe hunt. And this is what Uncle Verlin used to do. For weeks before he would take you, he would tell you all about snipes and snipe hunting, how delicious they were to eat and, and how you catch them. He'd tell you how stupid they were, and all you had to do was find a snipe trail, sit there with an open gunny sack at night, and call to them. And if you did this right, they would run right into your sack, and you could scoop them up and enjoy snipe stew that night. Well, my dad, he, he fell for this hook, line, and sinker. And uh, Uncle Verlin would say that you had to wait for the very best night to do it. There needed to be a snipe moon. And a snipe moon was just a little sliver of a moon that didn't give much light. And you'll see later that darkness is, is key to the success of this working. You also needed to practice the snipe hunting call, which involved little clucking noises, like a... And then in a high-pitched whine, you'd say, Here, snipe! Here, snipe! And then you cluck some more, and, and you just do that. So all week, you'd be practicing your snipe calling skills. And then when the night finally arrived, all of the boys and the ranch hands would get together to help you out on your first snipe hunt. So my dad and Uncle Verland were designated as the snipe hunters, while the ranch hands would hike up into the hills to supposedly scare the snipe down the trails and into their sacks. But before they left... Uncle Verlin would go down to the hen house and pick out a nice big hen, and he'd be wearing a really large overcoat. And he'd take that hen and kind of stick it down into his coat and hold it there under his arm. And since it was dark, you really couldn't tell that anything was unusual about his appearance. Well, off they'd go into the hills, and the ranch hands would hike up a little further but then, eventually, they'd circle around and head back to the bunkhouse. Well, meanwhile, Uncle Verland and my dad sat there with their gunny sacks open, and they'd start calling. Here, Snipe! Here, Snipe! And, and after a little while, Uncle Verland would say, I can hear them coming. Keep calling. And oh, all this, the excitement was building. And as they sat there clucking and calling, Uncle Verlin would slowly unbutton his coat and then in one swift movement, grab the hen by the legs, pull it out, swing it around his head a few times, and then drop it down into the bag and hold it up, triumphantly shouting, I've got mine! And, and, and there in the darkness, all you could see was this bag bouncing up and down and feathers flying and all this squawking. And then he would say, you know what? You can have all the rest. And then he'd leave you there. Well, after that demonstration, how long do you think you'd sit up there in the darkness calling for snipes? For hours. And then finally, after you were hoarse and cold, you'd walk back to the bunkhouse and be welcomed by the laughter and the applause of all the other ranch hands. Well, the moral of the story is this. You can't catch a snipe. And why? Because they don't exist. You can't catch something that was never there. And I believe that the Nephites, at the time of Samuel the Lamanite, as well as many people in our day, are on a snipe hunt. They're hunting for something that is impossible to find. And what is it? See if you can find what it is in Helaman 1338. And there Samuel says, Ye have sought all the days of your lives for that which you could not obtain. Ye have sought for happiness in doing iniquity. 
which thing is contrary to the nature of that righteousness which is in our great and eternal head. Well, what is the snipe that the world is hunting for? Happiness in iniquity. It's impossible. It's contrary to the nature and the laws of the universe. You can't catch it because it doesn't exist. Remember what Lehi said back in 2 Nephi 2.13? If there be no righteousness, there be no happiness. And Alma the Younger in Alma 41.10, wickedness never was happiness. And yet, many spend the bulk of their lives trying to do just that. In a way, they're sitting out there in the sagebrush with their gunny sacks open on a snipe hunt. It reminds me of this famous quote from C.S. Lewis. What Satan put into the heads of our remote ancestors was the idea that they could invent some sort of happiness for themselves outside of God, apart from God. And out of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery. The long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. So, we've got to be wiser than they. Or else, someday, we may find somebody behind us in the sagebrush laughing because we bought into his lie. We thought that if we just sat out there clucking and holding our bag of anticipation open long enough, happiness would run into it and give us everything that we wanted. Unfortunately, the longer we sit out there, the harder we try, the more of a fool we make of ourselves. In Enoch's vision, in Moses 7, do you remember what Satan was doing when he looked down at the misery of the wicked? He was laughing laughing at their pain, their suffering, their foolishness. To him, it's like a big practical joke. Well, what was the Lord doing in that same vision? He was weeping. The happiness and salvation of his children is no laughing matter to him. So, a few questions to consider here. Are there any snipe hunts that you've been on lately? or ways that you've been searching for happiness in iniquity. And how's that working out for you? And then also, what happiness have you experienced through living righteous principles? Well, God doesn't want us to be fooled by the snipe hunts of the world. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to be happy. So there are some things that he does to help us, to help us to keep from being deceived. And in the final chapters of Helaman, he sends the people two things to help them. Servants and signs. Servants and signs. Let's take a closer look at these two great blessings. So first, he sends servants or prophets like Samuel the Lamanite to prophesy and to teach and to warn and to reveal the practical joke before it gets too serious. Prophets are the guys that come in and say, hey, don't fall for it. They're just trying to fool you. God's servants alert us to the fact that snipes aren't real or that you can't find happiness in wickedness. Unfortunately, Satan doesn't take this threat to his plans lightly and he tempts people to reject that help. So how do people often react to the words and the warnings of the prophets? Well, these chapters give us some examples of that. So I invite you to do the following rejecting the revelator's crossword puzzle to find the words that describe the wrong way to react to the prophets. So here they are. And I'll make this available for download. But let's go ahead and take a look at the answers, assuming that you've had the chance to do that. Number three, across. They get angry with them and seek to destroy them. Four, across. They cast them out, mock them, cast stones at them, and slay them. Uh, so, So they make fun of them. And in the previous one, in 1410, Samuel gives one of the reasons that they reject him. 
He says, because I am a Lamanite, you are angry with me. So there's a little bit of racism or prejudice there that they feel gives them leave to mock and reject him. Like, no Lamanite's going to tell me what to do. And similar kinds of mocking and prejudices are used to reject modern-day prophets as well. People might say, uh, they're too old, uh, too many Americans, uh, too behind the times, too white, too strict, too lenient, too left, too right, too soft, too hard. They mock their backgrounds, their speaking ability, their leadership style, their policies. There really is no end to the criticisms that are leveled at the living prophets. Well, five across, they won't receive them. They reject. And number seven across, I think this one is particularly important. They put up walls to keep them out. Right? When they cast them out of the city, now they have placed a wall between themselves and the words of the prophet. Well, what walls do we put up between ourselves and the modern day prophets? Uh, there's the walls of pride. I don't need to listen to them. I don't need their counsel. I know what's best for me. The walls of laziness. I don't have time to listen to them speak for eight hours on conference weekend. There's the walls of sin. The walls of apathy. I just don't care. I've got better things to do. The walls of disbelief. Well, hey, I think they're getting it wrong. I don't believe they're actually speaking for God. There are many examples of walls that people place between themselves and the prophets. Well, now the down clues. They harden their hearts against them. Two down, they get angry, cast stones at them, and shoot arrows at them. Now, thankfully, I think we are past the days where their physical lives are in, in danger. But do people still try to knock them off their walls? To dismiss them, accuse them, try to make them look silly, doubt their motives, or deconstruct their messages? The arrows are still flying all around them from the bows of the media and the skeptics. But fortunately, for our modern prophets like Samuel, they have the Spirit of the Lord with them, and they continue to stand strong. And then finally, number six down, they cast them out. And today, I believe that the most common form of casting out prophets is by ignoring them. So you can see that there are lots of walls that are put up in front of the prophets. The interesting thing is, according to the story, what do prophets do when walls are put up in front of them? They climb them. <laughs> they keep trying. They do whatever they can to get their message out there. Some of the things they do nowadays to climb the walls, uh, they broadcast their words to all the world. They send out church magazines each month. They produce Mormon messages. They, they give special firesides, participate in interfaith activities, provide humanitarian aid, travel the world speaking to various congregations, release proclamations and official statements. They do all kinds of things on social media. The prophets are constantly climbing walls and shouting their message to the church and the world. Well, there's another reaction to the prophets that, that I want to add here, and it comes from Helaman 13, 25 to 26. And Samuel says, And now when ye talk, ye say, If our days had been in the days of our fathers of old, we would not have slain the prophets. We would not have stoned them and cast them out. Behold, ye are worse than they. So, so sometimes the problem isn't that they don't believe in prophets. It's that they claim to believe in the prophets of the past, but they reject the prophets of the present. And Samuel teaches the principle that if you reject the prophet of the present, you would have rejected the prophets of the past. Jesus taught the same principle to the Pharisees. And do people still do the same thing today? Now, Spencer W. Kimball once said, Even in the church, many are prone to garnish the sepulchers of yesterday's prophets and mentally stone the living ones. We can't claim allegiance to the principles taught 
by Gordon B. Hinckley, David O. McKay, Heber J. Grant, or Joseph Smith if we can't accept the teachings and the leadership of Russell M. Nelson? Now, there's a sister principle to this truth as well. Have you ever wondered what you would have done had you been alive during other eras of scriptural history? Have you ever wondered if you'd had the faith to cross the plains with the pioneers? Would you have had the faith to build a boat with Nephi? Would you have accepted Jesus Christ's miracles and his teachings during his mortal ministry? Would you have followed Moses through the Red Sea and into the wilderness? Sometimes you might wonder. But this principle tells you exactly what you would have done. If a true principle is that if you reject the prophets of today, you would have rejected the prophets of the past, then something else is true as well. If you accept the prophet of today and follow him and believe in him, you would have done the same with the prophets of the past. If you strive to follow the counsels and the teachings of President Nelson, I believe you would have had the faith to cross the plains and build the boat and accept the Savior. Both principles are true. Well, thankfully, with all those walls that the world puts up, our prophets always get up on them and brave those arrows and those stones, and they continue to stand strong. But there's another blessing that God often sends to help us navigate a snipe-hunting world. Signs. Now, we've already established in the book of Helaman that signs do a poor job of creating faith, but a great job of reinforcing it. These people have already witnessed the sign of Nephi predicting the murder of the chief judge. And, you know, they didn't seem all that impressed by it. So now, God is going to give them signs. Bigger signs. And this is new. Prophets going all the way back to Lehi in the Book of Mormon had predicted the coming of the Savior. But not until Samuel do we have a specific sign mentioned of his birth. And it's a doozy. What is the sign? What was the predicted sign of Jesus Christ's birth? It's in 14 verses 3 through 6. And behold, this will I give unto you for a sign at the time of his coming. For behold, there shall be great lights in heaven, insomuch that in the night before he cometh, there shall be no darkness, insomuch that it shall appear unto man as if it was day. Therefore, there shall be one day and a night and a day as if it were one day, and there were no night. And this shall be unto you for a sign, for ye shall know of the rising of the sun and also of its setting. Therefore, they shall know of a surety that there shall be two days and a night. Nevertheless, the night shall not be darkened, and it shall be the night before he is born. And behold, there shall a new star arise, such an one as ye have never beheld. And this also shall be a sign unto you. And behold, this is not all. There shall be many signs and wonders in heaven. Well, that, that's quite a sign, isn't it? Basically, the sun is going to go down and it's not going to get dark. Now that is an unmistakable sign. Then he's going to prophesy the sign of his death in verses 20 through 27. And I'm not going to read through the entire text, but basically he prophesies two things. When the Savior dies, there will be darkness and destruction. The first sign of his birth is glorious and riskless. There's no danger associated with it. But the second sign is destructive and frightening. So it's like Samuel saying, if I'm right about the first sign, then you're going to know that I'm also right about the second one, and you can be prepared for it. Now, just a bit of a side note here. I really find the two signs interesting, and I believe there's a message taught by them. Why is it days of light when he's born and days of darkness when he dies? What's the principle there? Well, it teaches me that when Christ comes into your world, into your life, that's what he brings. Light and clarity and rejoicing. But when Christ leaves your world or your life, or when we push him out of it, 
there is only darkness. Christ, light. No Christ, darkness. And which of those two signs describes your current circumstances? Do you have more of a sign of his birth or sign of his death kind of life? And if you're in the darkness, I invite you to let him in. Let Christ be born into your world with all of his life-giving light and energy. And if he's already there, don't let his presence die for you. Keep it alive. and Walk in the light. Well, back to the purpose of signs here. Uh, The key phrase to look for is to the intent. And I see two basic ones. What is the twofold intent of these signs? Look in the following verses, 1412, 1428, and 1429. And in verse 12, he gives signs to the intent that ye might believe. And in verse 28, same thing to the intent that they might believe. But he adds another reason here too. To the intent that there be no cause for unbelief. Or in other words, these are going to leave you with no excuse for unbelief. My power is going to be miraculously and clearly demonstrated. No reason or basis for your doubts. Those two purposes are reiterated in verse 29. He says, to the intent that those who believe might be saved. And those who will not believe, well, it will make for a righteous judgment to come upon them. God will be justified in his condemnation. He can say, I gave you every reason in the world to believe. I almost made it obvious to you that I was there and that my gospel was real and that my principles were true. And and those signs may seem pretty spectacular, and and some may wonder why God doesn't seem to do things quite like that anymore. Well, as we near the second coming, maybe we will. But personally, I do believe in latter-day signs. I believe that God still sends them, and frequently. There are general ones, but more importantly, I think he sends signs to individuals. And they may not be as dramatic as a day and a night and a day of light, but they're there. I've heard students, friends, family members, and even strangers share these kinds of things. Unexplainable circumstances, answered prayers, medical miracles, dreams, visions, help from outstretched hands of service when people were at their lowest. Comfort from the unseen world, not to mention the miracles of creation all around us, the the power of the scriptures, and the guidance of living prophets. We have signs enough that God is there. I've heard many, many stories and experiences from people inside and outside the church and have experienced these things in my own life as well. Too many to doubt that God is an active and present force in the lives of his children in today's world. Uh, There are signs out there. God is still a God of signs and miracles. And I'm pretty sure that many of you right now could attest to that fact as well. But there are two ways that we can react to those signs. As verse 29 said, there are some that will believe and some that will not believe. And at the end of the book of Helaman, the majority of the Nephites fall into the latter category, despite an increase in great signs and wonders in angelic visions. So how can people not believe when signs clearly indicate God's power is present? They rationalize. They rationalize away the signs. And that's why I find the last verses of chapter 16 so fascinating. It's basically a collection of all the major ways people dismiss God's signs. And you know what? Satan hasn't changed his tactics much over the years. I think you'll see that the same rationalizations that the Nephites used back then are the ones that people continue to use today. I'm going to give you the verses 
and I want you to find as many different rationalizations as you can, okay? So the verses are Helaman 16, 15 through 23. What do you see? And I encourage you to mark them as we go along. Here's what I see. Verse 16. Some things they may have guessed right among so many. But behold, we know that all these great and marvelous works cannot come to pass. This is what I call the rationalization of coincidences. If there seems to be some unexplainable miracle or happenstance, it must have just been a coincidence. It's a coincidence that a resolution came right after you offered that prayer. It's a coincidence that this person was healed after receiving a priesthood blessing. They would have recovered anyway. It's a coincidence that something a prophet said actually happened. Lucky guess. And the fact that things in your patriarchal blessing have turned out to be true, well, they're just self-fulfilling prophecies and generalizations. It's like that's their only explanation. All signs are mere coincidences. My response to that accusation? That's a lot of coincidence. In my life alone, there have been way too many instances where coincidence just doesn't seem to cut it as an explanation. I think I'm intelligent enough to recognize a pattern when I see one. Verse 18, they say, It is not reasonable that such a being as a Christ shall come. This is the rationalization of unreasonableness. Now, I personally feel that the gospel is very reasonable, and it makes sense to me in a rational way. However, to those in the secular, unbelieving world, things like miracles and golden plates and angels and a spiritual afterlife are just never going to seem reasonable. And my response to that? Aren't we living in a world now where we can do things that to past generations would seem miraculous, impossible, or unreasonable? I could see somebody saying that it's not reasonable to believe that a person could travel across the ocean in a matter of hours. And yet, now we can fly from New York to Paris in less than a day. They could say it's not reasonable to think that you could carry a small device in your pocket that allows you to communicate with people around the world, listen to music, access the bulk of man's collective knowledge. They could say that it's not reasonable to believe that a man could walk on the moon. And some people still struggle with that one as, uh, as conspiracy theories abound. There are a lot of things that would not seem reasonable then that are completely reasonable now. It's just not a very good explanation. Just because something seems unexplainable to us now doesn't mean that it's going to remain that way forever. Verse 20. We know that this is a wicked tradition which has been handed down unto us by our fathers. This is the rationalization of tradition. We can dismiss these things because they're old-fashioned, they're obsolete. The only reason people believe these things is because it's been passed down from generation to generation. Children brainwashed by their parents and their parents brainwashed by their grandparents. It's a wicked tradition. People just need to wake up and live in the present. The modern age has all the answers. Don't hold on to these outdated and silly beliefs. There is a certain sense of pride that accompanies the feeling that you're ahead of everyone else, that you're progressive, that you've discovered the real truth hidden for ages, that you've really figured things out. Oh, mom and dad, they're still stuck in the past. But me, I've been awoken. These are just traditions. And my response to that is, is it fair to dismiss something just because it's old? Or is it possible that things of the past have been believed for ages because they're true? Because they're fundamental? Now, yes, there are some things of the past that we do need to move on from. Just because it's old doesn't necessarily mean that it's true either. It's that neither the fact that it's old or new is the basis to dismiss or accept it. We've got to approach things on their own merits, not their age. Well, also in verse 20, right at the end, they complain that Jesus is going to be born in the old world instead of the new. 
Therefore, they can keep us in ignorance, for we cannot witness with our own eyes that they are true. The rationalization here, I call it seeing is believing. I can only accept it if I can witness it with my own eyes. If I can't see it myself, I can't accept it as true. I can't accept a belief in God because he's never been shown to me and nobody's ever photographed him. I can't believe in Joseph Smith as a prophet because I wasn't there for the first vision. I can't believe in the Book of Mormon because I can't handle the golden plates myself and they haven't archaeologically uncovered a sign that says, Welcome to Zarahemla yet. The physical, tangible world is all that matters to them. If I can't see it, I won't believe it. But yet, then you have the rationalization of verse 21. And oh, this one is really devious. So look at what they say here. And they will, by the cunning and the mysterious arts of the evil one, work some great mystery which we cannot understand. Oh, can you see how good that is? They have successfully protected themselves from any possible sign that might come in the future. Even if there is some great sign that we don't understand, it's because they made it up. It's smoke and mirrors. It's a magic trick. Some evil power that they're using. So in the last verse, it's seeing is believing. And in this verse, it's, well, you can't always believe what you see. You just can't win with these guys. They have blocked themselves from any manifestation of God's power. They've hardened their hearts. Nothing can penetrate it. Not even something like a day, a night, and a day of light is going to work. And then there's one final one at the end of that verse. They will work some great mystery which we can't understand, which will keep us down to be servants to their words, and also servants unto them. For we depend upon them to teach us the word, and thus they will keep us in ignorance if we will yield ourselves unto them all the days of our lives. I call this the anti-authority rationalization. People out there are just trying to control and manipulate you. Don't trust or believe them. Don't trust parents or prophets, church leaders. It's all a power struggle, and the church just wants to run your life. And to that I say, I have never been coerced to do anything as a member of the church. It's all voluntary. Nobody has ever commanded me to do something or to act in a certain way. It's always been by invitation and encouragement. Well, there you have it. The six great rationalizations. And do you agree? Aren't people still using the same ones today? Hopefully, you've never found yourself using them. Some questions you might ask during this section of the lesson. How has accepting God's servants blessed you? What signs of God's power have you experienced in your life? When have you witnessed one of the six rationalizations? And how would you counter their arguments? I'd like to end with these verses from Helaman 15, 5-6. Here's the alternative to rejecting servants and signs. In this wonderful role reversal in the Book of Mormon, it's the Lamanites this time that stand as a powerful example for us to emulate. And I would that ye should behold that the more part of them are in the path of their duty, and they do walk circumspectly before God, and they do observe to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments according to the law of Moses. Yea, I say unto you that the more part of them are doing this, and they are striving with unweary diligence that they may bring the remainder of their brethren to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, there are many who do add to their numbers daily. That is what I hope we can do as members of Christ's church in the latter days. Let's stay in the path of our duty, walking circumspectly, which means carefully, before God keeping the commandments, and sharing the gospel with unwearying diligence. And I'm confident that if we follow that simple formula, we're never going to be taken in by the practical jokes of the adversary. 
remember, you can't catch a snipe. It's impossible. You can't find happiness in iniquity. So, heed God's servants and watch for his signs. If we do that, happiness in this life and in the next will be ours. Well, thank you for joining me this week. Uh, I hope you feel that you learned something by spending this time with me. If you did, I'd like to invite you to share it with somebody. And I'd also love it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons if you haven't done that already. That's what helps the channel to grow and, and to be seen by more people. And I'd like to thank all of you who have over the year sent such nice and encouraging messages and thank yous. I really appreciate those. I'm so grateful for all of you who give me a chance to share my love of the scriptures every week. Thank you for watching, and as always, get out there and teach with power.